Hello, everyone. Thank you so, so much for joining us in this discussion as we learn tangible solutions through cooperative farming. My name is Ebony Gustav, and I work with the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. We are an alliance of over 130 grassroots organizations that advocates for federal policy reform to advance the sustainability of agriculture, food systems, natural resources, and rural communities. The intention of hosting this webinar in partnership with the Cooperative Food Empowerment Directive is to provide history, tools, resources, and examples of how to build economic sustainability through Black cooperative farming. Our federal agriculture system was developed from oppressive labor and continues to be manifested in different forms today. In just the past century, over 90% of Black farmland has forcibly and systematically been lost. The system was not built for Blacks to thrive, but rather to survive at the expense of their own freedom. While this webinar will touch on some of the historical and present day inequities to be aware of what we are up against, we will be focusing on solutions. The government could and should be an ally for resources and reparations, but even when that falls short, we still have the opportunity to leverage our collective power. As we will learn in this discussion, when systems have failed, Blacks created their own. We need to rekindle our connection to the land as a form of healing, community building, and empowerment. We must not forget that we are the original stewards of the land. Making noise about inequities is imperative, but true resistance lies within collectivism and land ownership. This is an opportune time for our white allies to take a step back listen to the needs of Black farmers, increase their visibility, and collectively advocate for policy reform that uplifts them. We have a diverse group of races, community leaders, advocates, sovereignty seekers, Black farmers, and aspiring ones tuned into this webinar looking to share and access tools so that we can co-create a new narrative. I will now pass it over to Dallas to introduce herself in COFED, and then we'll hear from our amazing panelists. Thank you, Thank Ebony. You, Ebony. First of all, I just wanna uplift you for creating this space and this panel. You are doing amazing, necessary work, yeah. Uh, so if everyone could just collectively cheer Ebony on, this is definitely her work in action. Um, Yes, yes. So my name is Dallas. I am the Engager of Enchantment at COFED, the Cooperative Food Empowerment Directive. I love COFED. I love what we're doing as an organization. We dream of a liberated food system that includes farm workers to um, wait staff in restaurants. And we dream of cooperative economics being our regular day to day, not an alternative to the mainstream capitalist society we live in now. So I'm really honored to be here as um, also a beginning farmer. I'm the owner operator of the Harriet Tubman Freedom Farm in Whitakers, North Carolina, which is my 10 month old baby. Um, I'm psyched to be on a call facilitating this panel with people who have been in this game for years. Looking forward to learning from you. Um, I know a few of you from either your work collective courage shout out or in person and um, this is really a great honor and a blessing um, so I'll be facilitating and I want to start off with introductions of our panelists uh, Jessica Nembhard you're up first How about now? Okay, great. Um, I'm so excited to be on this panel. Thanks, Ebony. Thanks, Dallas, for hosting this. As um, Je My name is Jessica gordon Nemhard. I will also start by acknowledging the original stewards of the land and want to bring our ancestors into this space. 
I am Professor of Community Justice and Social Economic Development in the Department of Africana Studies at John Jay College, part of the City University of New York. I am the author of Collective Courage, a History of African American Cooperative Economic Thought and Practice. I'm a political economist with a PhD in economics. I study community economic development, cooperative and solidarity economics, racial wealth inequality, and uh, community-based approaches to justice. I'm a social activist, a scholar activist involved in the US worker co-op movement and the solidarity economy movement. I'm on the board of several co-op organizations such as Grassroots Economic Organizing Collective, Green Worker Cooperatives, Southern Reparations Loan Funds, and I'm a member of the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. I'm a proud mother and grandmother. Thank you so much for that introduction. Next up, Deshaun Blanding. Can you all hear me? All right, great. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning for those if you're on the West Coast. I think it's still morning there. Uh, my name is Deshaun Blanding. I am the Policy and Advocacy Coordinator for the Rural Coalition, which we, we are an organization, a coalition of about 50 different grassroots organizations uh, with membership in different races and, or, and ethnicities focused on building capacity um, and, and providing civil rights and equity within the agriculture and rural community development space. Um, my job with the Rural Coalition is to help with our federal policy. So making sure that all the policy that the USDA or USDA implements and the Congress puts out that relates to rural communities and agriculture is inclusive and and intentional about making sure that black and minority voices are heard and, and included in policy. Um, as an organization, our major focus is providing capacity building for our farmers tied to our federal policy, which is tied to our research. And so together through those models, we're able to have a grassroots and community driven effort in order to handle all federal policy solutions. Uh, we realize that rural coalition that it requires collaborative efforts to get work to get uh, anything done. So we make sure that we uplift our member organization voices. Um, personally, I continue, I'm building a, our family farm back in Manning, South Carolina, uh, working to try to help provide uh, justice and, and community development while being abroad, uh, being afar uh, in Washington, D.C., while also working on federal policy. I'm glad to be here on this panel and be able to contribute, but also to learn. Yes. Thank you, Deshaun, for that introduction. Next up, we have Taz Walker. Hey, thank you, Dallas and Ebony, for having me. Um, uh, my name is Taz Walker. I work with, I'm a co-founder with the Earth Sea Land Collective and um, also program manager for uh, the Rappi Farmers of Color Network. Um, Earth Sea formed in 2012 and it came out of a need for um, a group of black and brown folks to um, have secure a land base for, um, for land businesses, a small farm operation, a herb business, and cultural programming. Um, we saved and built relationship with each other over the course of the next few years. And then in 2016, uh, we purchased a 48 acre uh, parcel um, through our just savings, through uh, member, member uh, loans, through conservation easements and alternative lenders, we were able to, um, to kind of get landed. Um, currently, we have a farm, CSA, Tierra Negra farm that, um, that calls its home at Earthseed, um, a vermicompost business, New Soil, that calls its home there, and a Capoeira Angola, and Afro-Puerto Afro Rican Bomba group that also call their home there. Um, we have, in the, in the last year, we finished renovating um, a barn to use for community and uh, rental space, and uh, we really are just, um, in a place that we've we spent the first few years looking at acquisition and now we're in the management uh, phase um, of our work and and really looking at how to build capacity uh, for our land collective and to kind of um, undergird uh, the expansion of the businesses that are here so um, thank you all for having me and um, excited to be here Thanks, Taz. I'm super excited to have more North Carolina representation out here. And last not, but not least, uh, Sharana Moore.
Sharana, you're still on mute. Is that better? Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Sharana Moore. I'm the founder of Lawrence Community Gardens in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, I operate a non-for-profit farm, um, which is focused on food access and food security. We donate um, tens of thousands of pounds of food um, every year to our local pantries. Um, we offer youth programming and um, food is also donated to our youth program for them to understand money management and business principles. Um, the youth are solely responsible for growing the food, operating our farm stand, um, producing value added items for our farm um, as well. I am also one of the co-founders of the Indiana Black Farmers Cooperative in Indianapolis. Uh, we have a collective group a collab of local black urban farmers, um, some of the most powerful farmers in the city are part of our cooperative. Um, together with the cooperative, we formed our own farmer's market um, for our neighborhoods um, that have low access to um, food. Um, also, we participate in local CSAs and buying clubs and collectively we we do a lot of things collectively, but more important than that, we are all about uh, educating our neighbors and our friends and family on how to grow food and transforming lives through nutrient dense, um, high quality organic foods. And then also uh, making sure that our community eats well and uh, that we're able to distribute the food to the people not that we grow. So thank you so much for having me. Um, I really feel really honored to be a part of this uh, panel. Um, part of uh, the reason that I formed my groups were based on the Collective Courage book uh, that I read by Miss Jessica. <laughs> Incredible. Thank you, uh, Sharana, for that introduction. Thank you all again for being here. And uh, Dr. Jessica, I just want to uplift what you said. I set up my ancestor altar right behind me specifically for this. So um before we move into questions i just want to invite everybody to take a collective breath there's so many people on this call right now i'd ask you to relax your body close your eyes and a deep inhale through your nostrils and at the top of that breath just hold a lot of gratitude for the people on this call and the connectivity of this work and exhale love for yourself this land the people fighting for policy to support us, the people holding history and our stories, the people fostering beautiful space for the youth and people taking care of the soil that we need to live on. Thank you all so much. One more announcement. The last 30 minutes will be dedicated to Q&A time. So please throughout the panel, hold your questions inside of the Q&A box, which is down at the bottom of your screen next to the chat. Q&A box and the chat box are different things. So if you have a question, please make sure it goes in the question and answer box. We will try to get to everyone's questions, but we have things to do. <laughs> We're working inside of time constraints. So please um, keep your questions in there, keep them fresh. And we're ready to get into this panel if y'all are, I'm very excited. So the first question is for Jessica. Can you share two historic examples of black farm cooperatives and how they function as a means of liberation in direct response to systems of inequality. Um, yes, actually, can you hear me? Yes, right, I'm unmuted. Um, it would be my pleasure. It's actually hard to just talk about two, um, but I'll try. <laughs> I did want to say a little bit that, you know, uh, basically my research has found that in every era of US history, um, in every geographic area, whether rural or urban, I was able to find examples of economic mutual aid and economic cooperation among black people. And so um, it doesn't matter sort of where you look, right? It happened in every era using alternative businesses, alternative economics, especially collective solidarity economics um, in order to both survive, but also to sort of thrive 
in a, in a world that was unthrivable, right? So if you think about it, we were brought here in chains. We didn't even own our own bodies. We were farming and stuff for other people. Often we didn't even have enough food, but we managed to do little kitchen gardens together as enslaved people. That kind of mutual aid just continued on. Um, I guess my two examples are actually going to be um, organizations, not just a single farm because the other thing I found in the research was how important it was um, for black organizations to actually promote cooperative economics and to help develop um, credit unions to support buying of land and buying of machinery and equipment and also for co-ops to help people pool their money to buy in bulk and to farm together or to, f to farm using um, marketing strategies. So. 1880s to the early 1890s, a period of time very similar to our period of time right now. It's right after Reconstruction. It's the rise of uh, the Jim Crow apartheid era as well as the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. But it was also a period of time um, where back, what we call black populism, uh, the labor movement and cooperative movements were all working together. And the Colored Farmers National Alliance and Cooperative Union, a long name, because they were trying to connect to a lot of different things, right? So a farmers alliance, they also had um, farm workers, not just farm owners in the organization. They were a cooperative union because they were unionized, but they were also doing co-op development. They believed in co-op farming. Uh, they even believed in farm workers owning their own uh, mills and things like that. Um, they had chapters throughout the South at their height. They had over a million people in the 1880s. They often had to operate underground because this was a repressive period in terms of the U.S. federal government and state governments were very repressive in those days. But what they did, their whole purpose was to buy goods and supplies at, in bulk at reduced prices so that the farmers, black farmers and workers could afford um, supplies, food and equipment. They had lending exchanges, so precursors to credit unions where they could secure loans to buy land, to get fair mortgages, to buy the equipment they needed. They did co-op marketing together so that they would um, all bring their, their goods to market together. So like in farmer's markets and things. And so again, the point was to leverage what they had, right? Whether they were landowners or not, to leverage what they had to work with other people they're also a, um, a political party fighting for rights at state and federal level at the same time that they were actually doing, creating the lives and the work that they wanted to create. A similar organization in the 1920s and 30s, the National Federation of Colored Farmers. They wanted to stabilize black farming, increasing black land ownership through again, cooperative buying, cooperative production and cooperative marketing. They started out in Mississippi, their first, um, chapter was in Mississippi. Within two years, uh, they were in 12 different states with multiple chapters. They had a headquarters in Chicago because it was a little bit safer to be up in Chicago for the headquarters. They um, were using, uh, they created their own, again, a lending, not exactly a credit union, but a, a lending program because even the Federal Farm Loan Act was excluding Blacks from getting loans and um, mortgages to farm. And so they created their own mortgages, their own financial support system. Um, they also uh, were allowing blacks, uh, they were helping black sharecroppers to get better contracts until they could help them to buy their own land and own their own farms. And they were um, banding together so they could get better prices for their produce and, and lower prices for the supplies they bought in bulk. So again, the same notion that you had to do it together, that you had to do it in a way that included both uh, buying and selling, right? Both access to capital and doing that all under a, um, a democratic, collective, cooperative solidarity system and taking themselves sort of out of uh, the mainstream economic system, which was so exploiting them and, and stopping them from doing the kind of farming, having the land ownership that they wanted. Um, how much time do I have left? I wanted to actually give a third example. Do I have time for that? Okay, great. 
Um, and my third example is actually a little bit different. This is a coalition of, it started out a coalition of two black independent schools in North Carolina, the Bricks um, School, uh, Methodist School, and Terrell County School. This is the 1930s and 40s, so the height of the Great Depression. They were teaching black kids, right? They were getting black kids basically through high school with these independent black schools. But at the time in the Great Depression, they realized that just getting them a high school education wasn't enough. They started teaching them and their parents, their families, how to do co-op farming, how to start credit unions. And so both um, first independently and then together as a coalition in Eastern North Carolina, these black schools started co-op programs and adult education co-op programs, helped them to start uh, producer co-ops among themselves, to share tractors through a co-op. They started a credit union. They did healthcare co-ops because healthcare was also a problem. Um, when they did the coalition, first it was Eastern North Carolina. A year or two later, they joined a national coalition, not sorry, a state coalition in North Carolina and brought together blacks from all over the state to, to create manuals on how to create black credit unions and black farm co-ops so that there would be a way for people to understand, right? And I know COFED does this, the education part, understand how to do this, how to do it well, how to connect with people who are doing it. And that's what they did. They were able to um, make an arrangement with the state uh, Department of Agriculture to actually distribute the manuals they created and support this program so that within 10 years, they went from uh, three credit unions to 98, and then 48 additional, these are all black credit unions in the 1930s and 40s, and then 48 new black co-ops throughout the state of North Carolina. So that's another kind of you know, farm rural coalition for, um, for cooperatives. And then in the 60s until now, we have the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, which has done a similar thing for about six states in the South, and that still exists. Incredible. Thank you um, for that history. And I just want to uplift the Harriet Tubman Freedom Farm is 19 minutes away from Bricks. I grew up here, but did not know about it until 2017. So I'm so grateful that you've done this research and have this history. Um, and now that I know, getting more educated is one of my tasks. All right. Thank you so much. So our next question is for Deshaun. Can you please share some historical context and examples about the racial discrimination in federal agricultural policy? Can you all hear me? Great. Uh, so I think when we talk about racial discrimination in federal food policy, uh, it's, first it's good to start off understanding what is racist policy. I love the way Ibram Kendi presents it in How to Be an Anti-Racist, right? Where Racist policy is any policy that creates or sustains racial inequity. Um, and so as we look at, so what, what created this racial inequity? Um, we know all here that labor, the ex labor exploitation of our ancestors, African Americans for, uh, for over 200 years was the start of building up equity for white farmers. Um, so whenever General Sherman had the special field order number 15, which stated each family shall have a plot of not more than 40 acres of tillable ground, which we get the coin today, uh, 40 acres and a mule. Uh, we coined the term 40 acres and a mule. That was the, supposed to start building up equity for black freedmen, but that never was instituted. And so you had but, however, you have black farmers who were able to amass about 15 to 16 million acres of land between uh, around between 1910 and 1920. Uh, you had about 925,000 farmers, um, which made up about 14% of the farm population. And so how do we go from there to where we are today, where we only have 45,000 farmers who make up 1.3% of farmers? Um, that is a big disparity and this, the way we got there was through years of racial, part of it was racial discrimination uh, throughout the USDA programs that allowed for white farmers to continue to build wealth and, and took the wealth away from and dispossessed black farmers. Um, you look at the 1930s, so 1920 we have almost a million black farmers, 1930 the Agricultural Adjustment Act of 1933 was created to um, to stabilize farm commodity prices by reducing production. And so you 
take, they incentivize farmers to not farm by giving them payments and it exploited tenant farmers and sharecroppers who mostly were black um, by not allowing them to receive payments and white landowners will oftentimes uh, decrease their land cultivation and instead of giving and distributing some of that, the money to their sharecropper tenants. as so they continue to build their wealth with government aid, which continue to dispossess um, and create inequities for black farmers. Then you look into 1937, still in the New Deal era, trying to build us out of the Great Depression. Um, you have the Farm Security Agency created. By 1939, um, black farmers made up about 40% of all low income farmers within the South. But when you look at how the funding was distributed for black farmers or for to farmers in the South, maybe a, roughly a, less than a quarter of the rehabilitation loans were distributed to black farmers. So they were receiving less loans than the white farmers were receiving, which created another inequity or continued to create inequities for uh, black communities. And so that leads us, that continues to, to exist or, or happen for years where the USDA creates these programs, it goes to the local and state level, and they continue to discriminate against uh, black communities, not giving them loans. It actually was found that uh, it took, by 1990, it took 60 days for white farmers to be able to have their loans processed, where it took 220 days for black farmers to get their loans processed. And so throughout that time frame, you have foreclosures going on, you have black farmers' land being dispossessed because they cannot keep up with white farmers. Um, in addition to that, there was a, a large growth of, uh, of increasing the size of farms. And in doing that, you brought out about 600,000, they found about 600,000 black farms were lost during that time frame. Even though all farms were decreased, we lost almost all of our farms. Um, and that continued to dispossess us for years and years and years um, until you get to the 1980s where all of this racial discrimination is continuing to happen. And Ron President Ronald Reagan decides to close the USDA Office of Civil Rights in 1983, where now all the discrimination complaints that are happening are being ignored. There is no place for it to go um, until 1996, where the office was reopened uh, by President Bill Clinton. But at that point, the damage was done. Um, the damage continued to happen to our communities. Even in 1999, you had about 44% of uh, program discrimination cases were found to be backlogged for over a year. So even in the 90s, you still had this inequity happening for black communities, um, but you had organizations were coming together to fight against that. And I'm glad to be a part of one of those organizations, the Rural Coalition, where we continue to stand up with other organizations, the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, um, the Rural Advancement Fund, uh, the National Sharecroppers, all these organizations coming together and saying, we're not taking this, we're going to stand up for our communities. And they stood up with Timothy Pickford, many of us know the Pickford settlement that happened in, 19, in the 1990s. Um, but that was because Community, or community organizations said they had enough of USDA discrimination and they stood up to um, the USDA and were able to have the statute of limitations pushed back to 1981. At the time, it only could go back to two years. And so they had it pushed back from, um, from 1997, 1996 to 1981. So that allowed for 15 years of a settlement to happen and for restitution to be enabled for black farmers um, to receive payment who were discriminated against while, while the USDA offices were closed. Um, so this, this inequity continues to happen. It happened for years. And our job at Rural Coalition, and we work with many other organizations and trying to make sure this doesn't happen again, uh, making sure that we continue to have equity in agricultural policy. Um, since then, the USDA has taken steps. They, you know, the Pigford case did provide a settlement of 1.06 billion dollars in the first settlement, and Pickford two provided 1.25, one and a quarter billion dollars. Um, and whenever it was reopened for those who didn't were able to apply in the first round, and and that, that was open during the Obama administration. And so you had um, opportunities where restitution was trying to to provide more equity, 
and, and repair what it had damaged, but it still found that nine out of 10 farmers who applied for the, the pig for settlement were denied. So you still had an opportunity here where equity is trying to be granted, but still, um, it was still inequitable. And so we, we have to continue to stand up and, and be no, and notice uh, when we are continue to be discriminated against um, and make sure that we have opportunities like or fight for opportunities like set aside in our farm bill, set aside in all of the agricultural policies so that our communities can get the equity that we need in order for us to be sustainable. Thank you, Deshaun, for that response and, um, and your work. It's, a, it's definitely not ancient history, everyone. This stuff is still clearly going on. And it's really frustrating that the work is on us to call out the injustice instead of that just not being inherent in the system. Taz, this next question is for you. What have been the barriers to the Earthseed and Tierra Negra Farm Cooperative's success? Um, that's a great question. Um, it depends on, it really, you may have to do some follow-up questions on that one because it's, it depends on what time you're talking about. Um, I mean, uh, initially the barrier was, um, startup kind of startup money to get the, get the thing off the ground to, um, you know, put money together to start really looking at, um, at land that would suit our needs. Um, cause we came into it really looking at how to, pull our buying power together. So we didn't have, uh, we didn't have much capital to start off with. Uh, we, over the first year of our formation, we formed a kind of a member savings account that we put money into. Uh, not a lot because we became, we decided on a monetary amount that was doable for all of us. Cause we're, all of us are in a, a, a very diverse kind of class background. So um, we, it was important that it was something that was affordable to all the households and we continued to pay into that up until we, you know, paid the first down payment on the property. Um, so that was, you know, having startup capital was a barrier at first. Um, I would say that um, building trust in terms of tying our financials in together in terms of our, our relationships to money um, was another barrier because we didn't, um, we, we all had different relationships to our, our familial backgrounds in terms of money, how money was talked about in our families or not talked about, who talked about them. And that was a lot of the trust building, you know, when you're tying your financials into, um, you know, you're getting into bed with each other, so to speak, it's really, um, you know, up until the last moment when we were about to purchase the property, um, folks were you know, we're like, I don't know about this. And how long are we talking about? <laughs> I was like, well, until we get it paid off. So um, that was a barrier, that trust building, because folks always come back to us and say, well, why did it take like seven or eight years? I was like, because we didn't trust each other um, fully. And we still are learning to trust each other um, as we move forward. So it's not a, a it's, it's an ongoing process. Um, as, we, as we started to close on the land for the farm, um, I guess I just want to uplift the importance of the internal, the, the risks that the, each member, because we were able to pull some land in through an alternative lender and use some conservation easements um, to kind of uh, leverage some of the, the costs. But there was um, some members had to take a, a larger uh, shoulder of the burden a little bit more than others. And I think if in, in hindsight, it would have been good to know like what stress comes with that risk in terms of shouldering more of that burden um, because I think we may have done things differently in terms of how we think about that risk and and how and what what we could all take on so that it doesn't affect our cooperative our, our relationship with each other in terms of the collective um, and I think I mentioned before that we moved from acquisition phase in the first few years to management and that was a big hurdle because we we're like oh well We've, we all, we've acquired it, yay. Well, now we have to actually manage it and change structure to like, how do we manage the property? What infrastructure needs to be um, dealt with and what doesn't? And so there's a lot of decisions in terms of how we, um, where we put resources right away. Um, so that was a learning curve. And I, I don't know if that was a, a barrier or a learning curve. Um, 
And I think now the barrier is really like, how do we increase capacity in terms of hiring up and allocating monies for staffing? And that's the phase that we're in now. Um, it's, most of it's been done on a volunteer basis to some extent, um, even though we have kind of discrete things where it's like, oh, can we pay one of our members to do it, this and one of our members to do that? Um, but we're in a phase where we're just because we all have off farm jobs that we have to build um, our capacity um, through more hiring up. And so we're kind of wrestling with that. Or do we, or do we put more money into infrastructure? So a lot of the, since we've landed on the property, a lot of the investment is went into infrastructure because we want to make sure that we're not kind of blindly, you know, just putting, you know, just doing production in the ground and, and getting the business running, but we're not actually thinking of infrastructure and, and thinking three years down the line, five years down the line. And honestly, when I talk to, you know, um, I would say primarily white farmers, that's a lot of what I see in terms of the investment is infrastructure. Um, and, uh, and, and I would, in terms of farmers of color, I see less of that. And I, and I think that was something for me that raised the flag. It was like, we really need to prioritize putting infrastructure first, not just plowing up the field. Um, so, um, but having the resources where the number structure is a barrier. Um, so that's something we're grappling with too right now. Um, and I don't know how much time I'm at Dallas. I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm rambling a little bit. Okay. Um, yeah. So, um, <laughs> if you have any follow-up questions, Dallas, I'll put it to that. Cause that's a, might be a good stopping point. Yeah, that's great. Um, and thank you for calling yourself in on time. I'm actually not keeping time. I'm listening to you. So, <laughs> but um, thank you for that and uplifting the, the emphasis on the need for trust in cooperative work. I think that's something extremely exciting as I dream about for the Harriet Tubman Freedom Farm becoming a co-op, like really wanting community to trust and also understanding the necessity of that when we're talking about things, especially black people have a lot of trauma around like money and, um, um owning businesses especially in rural places and in the south um thank you so much so sharana this next question is for you what benefits does cooperative distribution offer independent farmers that would be difficult to obtain on their own oh wow uh, that's a mouthful uh in itself uh, so Indiana Black Farmers Cooperative is a mixture of producer, distributor, and worker uh, cooperative. So we have a, a very uh, diverse group of members who are able to not just grow food, but we also, a few of us have mobile farm stands where we're able to distribute out into the community. Some of us have roadside stands where we're able to sell directly to our neighborhoods. And then um, we also offer uh, extended services such as farm to table, um, food demonstrations, things of that sort. Um, to our community because we definitely want our neighbors to understand how to prepare the food that we grow. Um, so that's first off. Um, secondly, when we talk about the benefits of uh, being in a cooperative um, uh, organization, some of the things that we do that are very beneficial for our members that they wouldn't be able to do alone is um, when we established our own farmer's market, the reason we established our own farmer's market is because as small urban farmers without a lot of land and producing a lot of large crops, um, it's hard for us, us to, um, to sustain the insurance policies that come along with the markets. So the insurance policies can be upwards of a million dollars to vend just for the summer at some of these markets. And uh, the Indiana Black Farmers Cooperative um, actually took on the cost of the insurance and it's an umbrella so that our members could vend under our umbrella insurance as well as our vendors could vend at, at, and not have to supply um, insurance, uh, additional insured uh, documents for us. Um, that allowed us to increase access for uh, our community uh, for the food that we grow. Um, it gave us an outlet to be able to make money off of the food that we grow. So uh, most of our farmers, I'm the only not-for-profit farm 
in the co-op. So I use a lot of my benefits to help all the rest of the farmers because I do have that not-for-profit sales tax exempt status. So some of the other things that we do is, of course, we buy our seeds in bulk and distribute amongst our members. We purchase seedlings from a local uh, nursery that grows organic seed. We'll purchase those in bulk and distribute amongst our members. Um, also compost, which is one of the single most expensive things um, that we have to pay for every year. We buy in bulk and we'll distribute amongst our uh, member farmers as well. Uh, we've created wholesale and retail opportunities for our members for their produce that they're growing. Um, so that takes a lot of leg work to get out into the community to talk to organizations um, about buying our food and buying. Um, so we will collectively, for instance, if a if a organization would want to buy 100 cucumbers. But we know that we're dealing with small time urban farmers. Um, I may only have 30 cucumbers this week. Mother Love's Garden may only have 40 cucumbers this week. Legacy might have 30 that they can contribute. But together, collectively, we're able to fit, uh, fill the order for 100 cucumbers for our organization. So it's a collective um, selling power as well as a collective buying power. Um, we offer resources such as um, grant collaborations with our member farmers, tool sharing, um, bouncing off ideas, volunteers for each other's farms. Um, so that labor is always important. Um, and startup consultations. So if you're coming in as a new member to the farm, we will offer you a startup consultation. Come out to your property, walk it with you, talk about companion plants, what your goal is for your farm or your garden. And then, um, of course, then you've got to have that support, that emotional connection, that emotional support, which is one of the most important things. Um, when you're in this industry, and it's a tough uh, industry to be in, uh, I'm not the I'm not your uh, your idea of what a farmer would look like. First of all, I'm black and I'm a woman, so that's not when people say farmers, they don't think of black woman. And so uh, we've got that first barrier that we gotta uh, overcome. But being around people that are like me. Um, that have the same struggles as I do, um, we're able to talk and provide emotional support and encouragement to each other. And that helps us to keep going year, every year. <laughs> so, so that's probably one of the most important things um, in being in a cooperative uh, type of organization offers me and other farmers that we don't get when we're just independent. Sharana, I'm coming out to Indiana. My sister just moved there. I'm going to visit y'all. Um, well, that, yeah, that is so exciting. And I love that we just, uh, first round of questions ended with what you said, because it comes full circle back to what Dr. Jessica gordon Emhard was saying about, you know, leveraging these powers, the way you're leveraging your nonprofit status to support farmers who are working for profit and don't have, uh, you know, the, the tax benefits that you do. That's amazing. I especially love the taking out the legwork of the marketing piece as someone who's growing food on my own and trying to also get it sold. I would love that kind of community. So really feeling that. All right. So we're moving in the second round of questions. This one's for you, Dr. Jessica. How can farm co-ops offer economic independence? Thank you. Yeah. Um, so this is just a fabulous panel. I mean, in some ways, the, that's the panelists sort of answered some of this, but I'll try to pull it together from the research I did and what you've already heard. Um, so the economic independence issue, right, is partly because we live in this racialized capitalist society that has been exploiting people of color, especially black people, right, from the beginnings. Right, and so we need independence so that we stop being so exploited and so marginalized. And then the other reason we want independence is because we want the independence to do things that, that are culturally sensitive to the kinds of people we are, the kinds of people we aspire to be, that kind of thing. And often, if you're stuck in the, the traditional system, you don't get to do that. So the farm co-ops really allow us, I mean, you heard it especially with what Shakira was saying, right? 
We can reduce cost, right? We buy in bulk, if you buy in bulk, you reduce the cost of things, right? Uh, and you can sell in, I don't know, I guess it's sell in bulk, <laughs> right? And you can increase the price you get for things and you can do more, right? As she said, the 100 cucumbers, right? Each farm can't do 100 cucumbers, but together they can. So that kind of, right, that gives you independence because it allows you to do the farm at the scale you can do it, but operate at a larger scale because of the solidarity and the collectiveness of the whole group. So it gives you, again, that leverage, right? Also for Blacks in particular, to get out of debt peonage, right? Debt peonage is what sharecropping was. You were never ending debt cycle because you didn't own the, your own land, you didn't have access to supplies, you didn't even own your own seeds, et cetera. So being in a collective, doing cooperative farming, et cetera, can get you out of that. And also, as you saw, a lot of the examples of black farming also included credit unions because they realized, or credit exchanges, they realized control over capital, right? Not being exploited uh, in capital markets was also important. So to get out of debt, to get access to capital, right? Having your own, owning your own farms, owning, you know, having farm co-ops, helped with that. Land ownership, we already saw a million examples from all of us about how it enables land ownership. Again, sometimes you can't as an individual own the land, but you can as a collective, or sometimes you can't get the mortgage or get a, a good rate um, to buy the land, but the credit union can or the farm exchange can, et cetera. But also we get income generation and wealth, because again, once you own the land, you own the farm, you own it together, but you actually can generate income and you can generate income above your costs. And that means you can save, you can build wealth. Your land is wealth, your business is wealth, you know, the farm as a business is wealth. So that joint ownership of certain types of assets gives you that wealth and income that also gives you independence. Then you're suddenly not dependent on the people who are giving out um, free food or who are giving you bad jobs or whatever. You can pick and choose. You don't need, maybe even need a job outside of your farm because now the farm is actually stable like that. Um, one other kind of example of economic independence through cooperatives I just want to mention is Freedom Quilting Bee, which started in the 60s, late 60s, and again is, is a co-op that still exists, but it's had different growing pains through the 50 years. Um, but what Freedom Quilting Bee was really interesting because it was uh, the wives, sharecropping wives, so they were in that debt peonage situation. Uh, a priest actually helped them to realize that if they sold their quilts, um, they could bring in extra income for their families. So they started selling quilts, they, made an, they sold enough quilts to start a business, a co-op business, and to, to quilt together, especially in the winter, they were still farming. Um, within another few years, they made enough money to buy 23 acres of land. They built a sewing uh, factory. Um, so now they're actually working outside of their homes and doing quilting more full time. Um, they, the co-op actually creates a childcare center and an after school center because now that they're not working at home, they need something to do with their children. So they're solving a community and a family problem. That's giving them independence. And then the final independence piece, which was really fascinating, is that now this co-op owns 23 acres of land. Some of their families and a lot of the sharecropping families around them are getting thrown off the land because they're registering to vote and participating in the civil rights movement. And so they're being disenfranchised as well as losing their land. And Freedom Quilting Bee is able to then sell a couple of their lots to, um, to members who can actually buy them. And they also start leasing some of their extra lots to displaced sharecroppers who got displaced because of their political activity. And so that independence, owning their own land as a co-op, having that independence, not having to be beholden to the white landowners who are then retaliating against the political activity is really important. And so the increased ownership and control over land, over economics, over income, right? Um, being able to do sustainable agriculture, creating food security, um, if you own your own business, right, you can change the nature of work and the returns to work. You can provide ownership and develop assets. You can get wealth development, and then you can also create stability and independence, which allows you to do other social and political things that you couldn't do when you're beholden um, to white employ employers. Thank you so much for that. 
the word coming to mind for me is sovereignty and that's like my biggest dream for our people the next question is for deshaun where should black farmers who are interested in developing a farm co-op start how can they navigate things like getting technical assistance um, especially in regards to legal structure startup and are there federal programs available currently i know that was a lot yeah um, from the federal government perspective, and I'm sure the uh, other cooperative co-founders may have some other perspectives that they may be able to, to share as well. But from a federal government perspective, um, the, I will point into two directions. One would be rural development cooperative services. Um, they have some really good resources and guides for getting a, co a cooperative start uh, to start doing a startup cooperative. Um, it's like a four-phase, twelve-step guide that you can go into uh, cooperative services and rural development and be able to see how do you start your co-op from identifying the economic needs in your community um, and to being able to execute um, those needs and be able to fulfill your 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 dream and be able to put together your cooperative um, so i will say look into that and then as it pertains to grants um, the there are multiple grants also on the cooperative services site and rural development um, there's the value added grant um, that provides financial capital for producing and marketing value-added products. Um, there is a business and industry grantee loan. This one is helps with your business development. It helps you purchase land, equipment, supplies, inventory, um, with helps with debt refinancing and refinancing um, cash flow and, and help you create and save your jobs within your cooperative. Um, and then going back to part of the intent of having set aside because we know with policy um, in order to be truly uh, efficient we have to have a targeted universalism and so having targeted measures that create a universal goal and so there are some some specific programs like the socially disadvantaged group grant um, this grant provides technical assistance to socially disadvantaged groups within the co-op as you're able to help help your farmers within your co-op be able to have that technical assistance um, and then there's a rural development grant as well that does something similar, uh, but it's not it's not as targeted as a socially disadvantaged group grant. Um, the second place I'll point people to would be uh, cooperative development centers. Uh, they do a really great job at providing technical assistance for new co-ops, as well as helping with cooperative development issues once you get your cooperative started. Um, that's like the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, which we heard earlier. Um, and then they are focused mainly, mainly in the South, uh, but there are also other places, other development centers that you can look into. Um, the cooperative services site I mentioned on rural development has a document that has all of the cooperative development centers within each state, each that each state has. So I would encourage um, everyone to start to go to those places, looking into rural development sites as well as a rural development cooperative services as well as working with the cooperative development center to help you with your technical assistance and getting your cooperative started um, we're still continuing to fight for more loans and opportunities um, it's something that is necessary especially for minority farmers uh, socially disadvantaged farmers for providing more opportunities for these cooperatives so as you mentioned like it's it's imperative that we continue to um, do this collectively um, so Rural Coalition is most definitely a voice that is trying to continue to uplift uh, the needs for more opportunities and loans for our communities. Thank you, Deshaun. Good money out there, y'all. Go, the, go get them dollars. Um, okay, so we're coming up to our last question and then Q&A session. We want to leave 30 minutes of space. We're at 326, just as a heads up for the panelists. This question is for both Taz and Sharana. Um, what resources and policy changes do you need for support and development as a collective and or as individual farmers? As you want to go first? Um, no, go for it. Okay, so thanks for the seat. Um, the biggest thing I think that is needed um, uh, for a cooperative or individual is land. Um, we, we can't do anything without the land. We've got to have a place to grow. Um, so with that being said, in my urban setting, 
a lot of us homeowners have don't have as much land, right? So then we got to focus on the policy changes within our, um, our districts and our cities, right? So we talk about zoning. Um, to foster more homesteaders, we need to change, we need to look at a lot of the zoning, which would uh, affect our ability to have, raise chickens, have bees, um, you know, permits and um, issues with uh, fees from the city when our grass gets too uh, long. And that's a part of our permaculture designs. So those things need to be looked at um, on the local level, right? Also, I think about reduced municipal uh, water costs for growers. Um, city water can be very expensive when you're trying to grow crops in Indiana here. We haven't had much rain since the end of July. So uh, if I didn't have a well, I'd be really in a tight bind right now um, um, financially. Um, Changes in the market, in the policies for farmers. Uh, my own personal beliefs is that a lot of the farmers markets are designed and created to keep us out with those high costs of insurance, the insurance policies that they require in order for you to vend. We're just talking about um, adding a policy into um, the whole government, the USDA policy changes where it allows us as farmers to sell at any market uncut produce um, without um, those heavy uh, fines and without insurance requirements. It should be something in there that just protects us so that we don't have to have that. Um, don't ever forget human capital. Our human capital is so, so important in the work that we do uh, for urban farmers, right? We gotta, we gotta establish connections with our local gas stations, our local convenience stores, um, if we wanna sell our produce. Um, and that just, that just means that we have to have more support on the, on the farming side so that we can do more uh, gaining on the asset, on the personal asset side, on the human asset side. Um, that's it. That's so important so that people can get their local food. Um, I think that's, I think that's about it. That's all I can really think of. Um, from my end, what do you got, Taz? Um, I think that one uh, need and, um, and definitely in North Carolina, but, um, probably across this across the southeast i mean just the need for more credit unions especially black and indigenous uh bipoc credit unions across the um across the southeast um i mean jessica had named this around the uh, amount of credit unions uh, black credit unions in north carolina and that existed and many of those um, closed their doors around the 2008 uh, financial crisis and so um there's a gaping hole for um this these institutions that were, you know, a bedrock of communities for um, generations that aren't there, and there there needs to be um, a push to uh, re-imagine um, what those could look like moving forward. Um, so access to lending and lenders, um, we were able to access Earthseed, um, and a work with an alternative lender that was able to kind of uh, leverage the risk for some of the acquisition for the property, and and we wouldn't have some of that without that lender. So. Um, those type of lenders are key. Um, another thing that I feel like is important is that um, I know a cooperative principal is cooperative supporting cooperatives, but um, the, I guess, uh, and also reimagining of how there can be a, a cooperative ecosystem in the South, again, that we're, you know, across demographics where cooperatives are really um, giving TA um, to each other, really helping to leverage uh, startup cost as um, as a way to we that we all get there together that we go through this together um, so that that need for a cooperative ecosystem um, whether that fits in a policy place or just a need is um, I think key um, and I, I would say the last thing is just that um, a co-op doesn't necessarily have to look like what a co-op looked like a hundred years ago and there's many other ways that a co-op could um, and Sharona, and hearing the story of the work in Indiana, I'm like, this is, I, I just see, I could see a lot of other uh, entrepreneurs take on that model. 
And so I just, it's, I feel like it's important to, to rethink what a co-op looks like, what businesses could be, um, uh, could be started in a cooperative manner or where you're able to pull resources together. So I think that it's important to also reimagine what co-ops could look like moving forward. And um, I think that's all I got. Don't say it like it's a little bit. That's amazing. <laughs> I imagine, you know, if the world looked like this, especially the South. Um, yeah, these are th all things of my dream. Thank you all so much. Uh, that's the wrap up of our panel. We're going to move into Q&A time now. We've got about 25-ish minutes for questions. Um, so Ebony, I will turn it over to you. Thank you everyone for your thoughts and we'll keep moving with this Q&A. Hello everyone, wow, what a good discussion, like amazing, good is undermining it. Um, so we have quite a few questions in the chat box that we may or may not get to, but the first one we had is for the farmers. Um, Carmen wants to know, can you please advise individuals who own their land to get it registered as a farmland, both rural and urban? How does one start a CSA? Is it necessary to get a license to sell their products produced on the land? Shona, you wanna take that one? Yeah, so um, CSA is really easy um, to put together. Basically, uh, one, of my, one of the partners on my farm is, formed a CSA. Uh, grocery stores in the neighborhood closed and neighbors couldn't get groceries. So we came together, everybody came together and said, this is what we want. We want to buy local food. So first of all, you're going to have to find distributors for your local food, right? You're going to have to find your food producers. And then you're going to have to find your customer bases. I suggest starting off by looking in the senior homes because a lot of them can't get out and they know exactly what to do with the produce that you grow. So, um, you know, start off with going to them and saying, this is what we have to offer. And then you just gotta have wheels, honey. In order for the engine to move, it needs wheels. So you're gonna have to have like-minded people to come together as in our organization that said, hey, you know, we're all growing food and we want to make sure that our food gets out into the community that communities that we live in. So now we got to put our boots on the ground and we got to go into the senior communities and the apartment complexes and actually talk to these people about bringing our produce there. And I can guarantee you, most of them are going to be welcoming you. So um, just just do it. Like Nike said. Thank you. Shana. Okay, so the next question we have is from Ivan, and they want to know for a person starting, looking to start in urban agriculture, what would you recommend I should focus on first? I mean, I can say a little bit. I mean, one push that um, and before Herbseed, um, you know, got onto a, a, la a land parcel, uh, we were renting land uh, in downtown uh, Durham, North Carolina. <clears throat> and uh, I think there's a high rise there now um, that was built. Um, so we knew what was coming. And so we started to look right as that, um, you know, that kind of, push in, in terms of urban development was happening. But I think one thing that we realized was that the amount of the investment that we had in the urban uh, parcel that we had was not equal to the equity that we had in the parcel. And so that was a red flag. Um, the lease also had issues in terms of we could be, you know, removed within 30 days. Um, so I think having a good lease that is looked over by a lawyer um, is, is helpful, I think, in terms of looking at spaces. Um, and, uh, and I would say that um, making sure that your investment and equ equity are equal, um, at least equal in terms of the property that you're, that you're on. Thank you, Taz. Okay, and actually, 
there's a question for you. Um, I'm just learning about Earthseed Cooperative and I'm curious how many members started with the co-op and has membership grown? I mean, I can answer that quickly. I mean, we started with more members and it, currently we have seven. Um, and right now we're not, we're, I don't think in this form we're looking to expand. Um, it may be that we're well, I think we'll, we'll be expanding, hopefully expanding in the years to come, but we're still kind of in the management and infrastructure phase. So right now it's just us seven. Um, we've started conversations around what it would look like to um, look at housing um, as a future development. And so that is, we're, we're, again, we're kind of at a place where we're trying to really, these initial loans that we've got on the land, looking at how to reconsolidate some of the loans, um, get mem some members that have really shouldered the initial process off of loans um, and get them back into the LLC so that um, that we can have that members have a little bit more capacity to even build another house if they want to and then expand to look at like broader reach to support um, folks that want to maybe build in the future. So right now seven that could change in the near future. Taz, you're being put on the spot again by Jim Hafner. What is the legal form in which the cooperative holds its farmland? Is it an LLC where each co-op member has shares? Do you have plans or guidelines if a member wants to exit from new members to getting out equity? Yeah, we are, uh, we're, we're a, um, a, an LLC um, with a cooperative um, how we are cooperative and our cooperative principles are in our bylaws. Um, we worked with uh, Land Loss Prevention Project on that. They really helped us um, on the front end to kind of make sure that we're just not co copy and pasting cooperative bylaws somewhere on the internet, but really actually looking at them and them making sense for um, you know our structure. And yes, within that, Jim, um, we have uh, a kind of uh, structure and a process for members being able to come in and to exit and and the division of shares and ownership okay so this might be more for Sharana do you all advocate shared crop planning within collectives that include multiple farms Yes, absolutely. Uh, we uh, strategically grow same crops and strategically each individually grow a cash crop. So we know that when we go to market, um, everybody's going to have tomatoes, right? So you want to have enough tomatoes for your friends and your family and maybe for your own farm stand. And when we come to market, we can't all bring tomatoes because we'll only have tomatoes in the market, right? But if I'm growing carrots and I'm going to be the best carrot producer in the co-op, you're growing tomatoes. You're the best tomato producer in the in the co-op. We've got someone growing cash crops of lettuce and cucumbers. When we come to the market, baby, it's a beautiful spread. It's so gorgeous. But now with that thinking, everybody is eating at the end of the day. Our customers don't have to come to the market and pick and choose whose tomatoes they're going to buy. They're going to buy what they want to buy based on the selections that we have. But based on the selections that we have, everyone's going to eat at the end of the day. So definitely, yes, systematically grow the same and different. Thank you. Okay, the next question from Ocasio. Who are the tech innovators in the Black co-op world? How is technology shaping this ecosystem? I'm not a tech person. I was hoping someone else would sip some, but I do want to say something about my growing understanding of what they're calling platform cooperatives. 
and ways for multiple stakeholders like the producers and the customers to own the technical platform together or even um, for a co-op to own a platform. So like take Uber, which is not a co-op and not um, what well, the kind of system we want, but what if the drivers and the riders owned the platform together, not the outside exploiter who's exploiting the drivers right now, right? Um, you could have a platform that was co-owned. There's some existing ones. I think there's a photographer's one right now that kind of thing. There's also in New York City, um, all the co-op cleaning companies have a platform. I forgot the name of it now. Up and Go or something like that. Anyway, instead of you having, a, sort of like Sharona was saying about at the farmer's market, instead of you having to pick and choose between the four co-op cleaning companies in New York City, you just go on the collective platform that they have. You put in what kind of cleaning you want, when, what day, and the platform figures out which of the four cleaning co-ops is available that day, can do that kind of work, and matches you with them. So then the co-ops are not competing against each other. They own the platform. They own that web. It's not a website. You know what I call it, app or whatever. They own that together, and the app helps to, right, to, to distribute the work in a way that makes sense given what their, um, what their needs are, their availability, et cetera. And then uh, the app tells you it's going to be this co-op on this day, contact them with more, whatever, um, that kind of thing. So I'm thinking that that might sort of answer the question, right? So it seems like if we're going to a more digital world, owning these platforms together, owning the apps, owning the, um, the technology behind the apps, right, together, is going to be much more important and another way to sort of move into the future. Even if it's something like farming, you could see how the, one of these kind of co-owned platforms could help people get access to your produce or to some of the other stuff you do or something without even having to go to a farmer's market. And That's I also, excuse yeah. me, uh, I just wanted to say, I know there's a lot of, um, excitement around hydro and aquaponics taking off, um, especially in Texas. I don't know if it's cooperatized, but I've seen a lot of black agriculturalists turning towards this mode as um, a money maker. And I just want to uplift that technology also has ancient roots, aquaponics being uh, very indigenous systems in, in Mayan um, technology and culture. Um, and just a, a critique of like the techie side of farming. We have to protect our soil. If like, if everybody thinks growing in really chemicalized fertilized water is the way to go, we are definitely gonna miss out on um, taking care of the living biology that sequesters carbon, protects us, makes our food nutritious and delicious. Soil's great. So I do just wanna put that out there. Um, because as someone interested in food, I know that like hemp farming and the hydroponics, these things that can make a lot of money are not um, as sustainable as they are claimed to be. The other um, kind of new technologies I just remembered I learned from the Federation of Southern Cooperatives are these hoop houses instead of an expensive greenhouse to grow certain products in the cold weather, right? Apparently a hoop house is really easy to put together. You can have a hoop house building weekend with young people and whatever and build the hoop house in your community garden or whatever and then have a place to keep growing your food even when it gets cold, at least for the Northern states. And so again, it's a kind of technology. If you, As you said, technology can be old. It doesn't have to be just, um, digital that we, you know we think of technology as just digital now but it just means right another way to do some you know using new kinds of methods to do something well and so i think that's the other way we can think about this and often working collectively right two heads are better than one kind of idea you get a lot of new ideas to how to make life better for everybody and we can think of technology in that sense too. How are we making things better? How are we enabling something that we couldn't figure out how to do before? 
how are we sharing that and making sure it's available to everybody and that we're all able to use it to make all of us better. Thank you. So this is from Karen Washington. Hi folks, love you all. I love you. Looks like everybody else do too. Thank you so much for joining the call. And she wants to know, have you seen an increase of funds and donations because of, because all of a sudden Black Lives Matter? And if so, how do you make sure that the money and donations are coming from organizations and businesses that support your work and not exploitative? Can I take that one? Okay. So yes, we have seen an influx in donations. We don't care who they coming from, baby. We're going to use them for the co-op's good. We took all that money that they send us. We bought ceilings, distributed amongst the members. So yes, Black Lives Matter keep on mattering so we can get the donations that's good. Uh, if you support us, if you don't, if you sent us some money, guess what? We use every penny. So, yes, Karen, we did see more money. People are really, they're heartstrings. They want to give right now to Black people. And I just so happen to be Black, so. And, and I can add just a little, I mean, we, we've definitely seen more, um, donations and support come in. Um, we uh, were able to partner with the group um, with a kind of a campaign called Reparation Summer. And um, that was a partnership with a number of organizations and farms, but uh, with the Black Land and Liberation Initiative and also the National Black Food and Justice Alliance. And uh, they were able to somewhat curate or, or do some upfront training to um, groups and entities, uh, accomplices that were going to go out and help um, secure more funding and look at the more of a reparations model to bring resources into uh, land bases that need it. So I think in, that, in terms of that structure, it was really helpful because it, it took less weight, uh, it put less, um, there was less weight on the farm or, or, the, or the land base because there was support from a larger umbrella uh, entity to really kind of run the um, run the campaign and draw and bring resources into that. So that it feels like a useful structure so that there's not those exploitative extractive forces that are out there. Um, so one of the things that uh, I wanted to just comment about is not necessarily the monetary exploitation uh, that we had to worry about. We had to worry about them building the Black Business Book, uh, which uh, gave all of our information and made us all targets. So uh, we had to be more concerned about that than we did of people donating to exploit us. The people who donated to us were genuine. They had supported us in the past, and they were looking for more ways to donate to us, Karen. But more important, more than that, we had to worry about domestic terrorism as Black farmers in the city. Thank you. Okay, this next question um, looks like it'll be for Deshaun. So this is from Tom. Are there any policy proposals out there to provide federal funds to new and beginning Black farmers and farm cooperatives? It seems like the Pigford settlement was A, too small compared to the damage done, and B, targeted to Black farmers harmed our racist policies in the past. Now we have a new generation of Black people who want to farm and are starting new operations but face sky-high land costs and other obstacles. We lost um, Deshaun because he was having tech issues I feel like this question is right up his alley, unfortunately. So if anyone's dying to answer it. Maybe we can try to follow up with this person. Sorry about that. 
Um, okay, so the next question is from Philip. Thank you to all the panelists for your great contributions. My question relates to the dwindling number of black farmers touched on by Deshaun. Oh, well, maybe you guys touched on this too. Margins are really low, especially in small farm businesses, pushing young black farmers towards other professions and away from farms and farming businesses. What can we do to change this trend and make farming an attractive professional option again? I know Deshaun isn't here, but at our farm, we focus on youth. Uh, we, we focus on the youth engagement, right? So we, I, fo I target children that are 12 to 15 years old. Um, it's a pivotal uh, point in their lives where they're starting to develop really bad habits with eating, um, also getting them connected to the earth at a younger age, and also uh, getting involved with some FFA programming, right? So if I am able to keep these youth working with me through their high school years, they're able to go to college with full scholarships if they choose an agriculture-based uh, profession, which doesn't necessarily mean they have to dig in the dirt, but in, uh, in my vision is that the only way we're going to foster more farmers is to each one teach one. We've got to give back the knowledge that we learned and that we know to the younger generation. And that's been lost over the time with technology advancements. Our children are playing inside and they're watching TV and they're on the phones and they're on the video games and they're not outside. And so by, uh, creating more youth programming and inviting more youth into our spaces, into our growing spaces and teaching them and helping them understand what it means to live a sustainable lifestyle and to be homesteaders. That's the only way we're going to foster more uh, farmers uh, for the future. And, and if I can chime in just real quickly, I know we're about to run out of time, but um, I just wanted to uplift. Um, uh, so I, part of a I'm part of a collective of uh, black dirt collective that's you know primarily based in the mid-atlantic but uh, they're the the farmer base within this collective is fairly young and they actually came down to herb seed a few years ago for a, a larger meeting and it was it, I think it was important that it's not just uh, like well how do we you know uh, start you know more farm businesses but I think like what Sharana mentioned it's more of a like what's a social methodology for how do we engage uh, young people and engage families and also create a culture role space um, where uh, you know folks can can see themselves in it. Um, if you're if it's if you're just thinking of the trauma and not saying that the trauma doesn't exist in terms of um, labor and land in America because you, you you can't get away from that, but. I think that if you're creating more uh, innovative spaces in terms of how um, how folks can be in a cultural space together and also talk about larger kind of social political issues in terms of access to land, access to credit, um, and still have good food and <laughs> have something to drink and it be a fellowship space, then, um, and that's what I've seen have been effective for um, younger people getting into it. I've, I've got, there's two young, farmers I think of specifically, they always, they call me their, their fairy farm godfather. And I'm like, I'm not that old. Um, but, but they, when they were, when they came to this Black Dirt Collective event, it was that they felt hailed and they felt seen and they felt like, oh, I see myself in this culturally. Um, and I want to look at this in terms of a career path and a, kind of a cultural identity. So um, I think those spaces are important. And there was also lots of elders there that also shared their um, story to kind of also give a foundation for what we've been doing, you know, for over a generation. So um, those spaces are important just to uplift that. And um, yeah. Okay, so, um... It look, I'll just squeeze in one more question. We had quite a lot that we didn't get to, unfortunately. Thank you everyone for entering questions in the chat and being so engaged throughout all of this. I wish we had more time. Um, so Austin wants to know, 
Can you say a bit more about alternative lenders, who they are and how to connect with them? Um, is that directed towards me? Open. Okay. Um, I can say, I mean, for ourselves, I mean, we were able to uh, work with uh, uh, one of our loans with the group uh, Natural Capital Investment Fund um, that is connected to uh, uh, the Conservation Fund, and they were helped to they were able to help us put uh, one of our loans because we have multiple loans on our property um, directly into the LLC's name. And I mean, they have different geographic areas that they focus on. And they also are able to pull in more uh, uh, nonprofit funds to help kind of uh, uh, subsidize some of the, that risk. But, um, but I was also speaking to credit unions that maybe have more of a kind of social or response, uh, socially responsible lending arm. Um, and so there could be more, there are some maybe credit unions, CDCs that might be alternative lenders that would be able to. Uh, to um, potentially um, support uh, some of these new initiatives with farmers of color and black farms. So, um, but others chime in. I do know that the USDA does offer the beginning farmer loan program and they have a huge pool of money set aside um, for uh, the socially, um, socially disadvantaged group which includes veterans, Blacks, women, and Hispanics, um, so, and also low income. So that's a whole group um, that, of people that qualify for this particular funding pool. And um, that loan um, for a property can be upwards of $600,000 to be able to buy your farm. And then um, you also can qualify for additional funding and loan from USDA for um, equipment, um, overhead, that type of thing. So um, I know that uh, right now I'm going through the loan process, the paper, the paperwork uh, is like this thing. <laughs> so, so I'm intimidated. I've tried to fill it out like three times. I'm so intimidated by it because it's so thick, but it's really not that bad. Um, you would just reach out to a farm service agency or a farm service agency, um, specialists to help you fill it out and uh, that money's out there and it's available to us at a very very low interest rate so um that's something also you can check into thank you both so much all right so jessica had to hop off and go to another meeting it looks like unfortunately Deshaun fell out again, um, but we'll just do some closing remarks and I'll pass it to you, Dallas. Amazing, thank you so much uh, to all the panelists, especially Taz and Sharona, you're still here, but my heart is so full right now. I feel um, like this was an amazing conversation to have and I hope one day I can sit down and eat with all of you and continue the conversation and keep hearing about your success and this um, world you're creating is really powerful and so, so um, deeply embedded in our cultural ways as Black people in this country. So lots of thanks. Amazing questions in the chat and um, Q&A box. Thank you to all the participants. Um, Meredith Tyson asked an interesting question just about how uh, New York City and New Jersey area folks uh, Yankees can support Southern Cousins. And I, I just want to uplift that as a person in the South and from the South. Um, I think that's an amazing thing to be thinking about because we are also experiencing gentrification down here in rural areas um, and people getting pushed out of generations long, um, you know, existing in the South. So uh, challenging the notion of metro normativity and that progress only happens in city areas and urban areas is really helpful. Um, and I just wanna uplift again, a lot of gratitude for the history and ancestral wisdom that's come through all of the panelists. Taz and Sharana, if you'd like to close out with any last remarks. 
Um, I just, I'm thankful for y'all that making the space for this. Um, I'm really, uh, you know, we're, we're having to lean in, in terms of just a kind of a collective and a co-op of, of space of, you know, sharing our experience and our strategies. Um, you know, four or five years ago, folks were kind of like, oh, what are y'all doing? And then at this point we get connect, we get contacted at least monthly if not more now by different groups that want to form a, sim a similar um, collective on land. And so uh, it helps us, this process just helps us to like remember like our process, what, what we have written down, what we don't have written down and to formalize it more. So I think from that perspective, um, this has been really helpful as a learning tool for us. So thank you for that. Um, my closing remarks would be um, that as our economy is uh, crashing more and more and we're becoming more oppressed and depressed in every city, in every neighborhood, you can see more and more closings. Cooperative workings and cooperative organizations are becoming more and more popular. We're able to leverage our, uh, our knowledge, our experience, our skills with other people who are who have knowledge skills not necessarily the same as ours we're able to exchange uh, currency but not uh, do in dollars and cents if that makes sense it's a human currency that we build with the cooperative um, uh, organization model and that's what we are pushing and encouraging with the youth that uh, we are rearing at our farm and uh, with our neighbors and friends to establish a more uh, a togetherness a more of a family of services that we can offer amongst each other without having to have uh, money in our bank accounts Amazing. Thank you both. Ebony, go ahead and take us home. Oh, I am just overwhelmed with the gratitude and everyone that has been so engaged and all of the panelists for sharing your time and energy and knowledge with us. Um, this is priceless. Um, and I'm so glad that we can come in common unity and uplift each other. Um, and I hope that after this discussion, we'll all plant seeds literally and figuratively to cultivate abundance. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Deshaun just came back. <laughs> Deshaun, do you have any closing remarks? <laughs> I'm so sorry, everyone. I'm just going to keep my video off, but for some reason, my I'm having technical difficulties here. Um, the only thing I would say is just please continue to work collaboratively. Um, that's the only way we will ever really have equity in our communities um, if we do it together. And that's what the purpose of Black co-ops are. Um, that's the purpose of coalition. Um, that's the purpose of Know, of, of equity building is in order for us to do it together. So I really encourage you to continue to reach out to us or anyone else to continue to build coalition. Um, so that's the only thing I'll have to add. Sorry about that. My internet is terrible right now. No problem. Thank you for coming back in. All right, y'all. Thank you so much for your time. It's 406. We said four o'clock. So please have a good day. Keep doing the good work. And like Ebony said, plant those seeds, tend to your gardens and to yourself. Peace, everybody.